Dr. Don Booz is back on Profunda TV with a new book, Your Brain is Lying, How to Silence Your Inner Critic. Dr. Booz is an international executive coach and sought-after speaker. He's a trained French chef and an expert on wines who has a fascination with how the brain works. He's even been called a conversational anthropologist. You are watching Profunda TV with host Phyllis Haynes. It's a pleasure talking with you again. Uh, I'm really excited about your new book, but it's an audacious title, Don. Your it brain is. is lying. Yeah. How to silence your inner critic? Come on, but your brain is lying. I mean, what did you mean when you took on such a title? Well, yeah, that's it is an interesting title. It gets a lot of attention because people don't normally think that the brain is lying to them. And I didn't come upon this until uh, I just happened upon it about two or three years ago. And I've been developing this awareness. And finally, my clients said, you need to write a book. So I wrote the book and it came with this title. And the title came from um, one woman in particular. She said, I'm tired of my, my brain. Uh, tell me what to do. And I, and I said, well, what does your brain tell you what to do? And she was saying that the brain tells her that she's uh, an imposter. She doesn't know what she's doing. She just got a new job. And um, so I started to explore that with her and, and teaching her a little bit at that point, how do you talk back to your brain when it's not telling the truth? And then I discovered with my other clients that two things happen out of self-talk is that they develop, they, they develop this imposter syndrome and then the, have limiting beliefs because they've been taught this over a period of years. Um, what happens to the brain and how it develops and these programs that we've been sending messages. I think one estimates we get about 185,000 uh, negative messages by the time we're 18. Uh, wow. And so, yeah, that's incredible. So these started to play uh, out in my own life when I started to think, well, when did I become aware of my self-talk? I did not have a name for it, but I knew there was something in my head that was, was repeating what my parents told me. Like, you're not going to amount to anything. You're worthless. My dad even said, you, you were born on the wrong side of the tracks. I mean, that's how I was taught and the, and the limiting beliefs that came upon me. It wasn't until as much later as an adult that I started to figure out, I can change these messages. I'm not stupid. And in fact, I you know, started making Dean's List and became pretty successful. So uh, that's how the, the title came about, just trying to figure out what the brain is doing. It's been a, an exciting journey um, with my clients and with myself, just trying to figure out how we can change this or how manage yourself. Well, you're quite a consultant and coach to uh, numerous uh, high-powered health professionals and mm -hmm. institutions. And so uh, you would get feedback if this wasn't working. You must be getting great feedback on your uh, work. Yeah, I am. Yeah, well, people are starting to, their lives are starting to change. Um, they begin to realize that it's not just what's on going on in my head. It's my external uh, self-talk as well. Um, so in the book, I, I am now expanding more, but there's an internal self-talk and there's an external self-talk. Can, can you explain, can you explain those two things that what, where, what the differences are that you mean external and internal? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the internal we're most familiar with, uh, our brain speaks to us in a way that we wouldn't let anybody else talk to us who's been involved in our lives. But the external um, self-talk is really said to no one. It's usually spontaneous. It's, it's often a complaint. Um, it's probably a uh, current situation. Like last week, I was uh, walking in the store and um, behind me, this, this woman said, oh, it smells like a doctor's office in here. And I turned around and 
she said, oh, I, I didn't know you heard me. I wasn't, I wasn't speaking to anyone in particular. Um, I was at a meeting not too long ago, a hospital meeting, and someone behind me said, well, this was a waste of time. To no one in particular, just, just mm -hmm. kind of comes out. It's usually spontaneous. I was doing a lecture last week, uh, and it was so funny because this woman started to become aware of her external self-talk. She knocked off some papers on the table and she said, well, that was stupid of me. And er everybody heard, out, heard her and we started to laugh. And she started to laugh because she became acutely aware of her external uh, self-talk. Because it just, it just sort of happens. It's really said to no one. Um, and we pick up on it. Uh, and my, my wife and I laugh when either one of us have an external self-talk and it wasn't really directed at one or the other, but it, it just comes out about the situation. You don't think that's a function of age that uh, that self, external <laughs> self-talk is just uh, uh, incrementally increasing as one gets older? Well, that's true. Uh, research says that we do talk more uh, as we get older. Uh, my grandmother was constantly talking to herself and we were walking around with her wondering who she's talking to, but she's just, she used her self-talk to uh, go about her day, what she needed to do, uh, sort of problem solve and that kind of thing. Said to no one, but it was just out there. It's kind of interesting. Well, your, your book, book is very user-friendly. Um, and it's a very practical approach to this problem. But I have to be the devil's advocate a little bit. Can you really, can you really stop? Let's talk about the internal self-talk because that's the yeah. one that's been yes. filled by parents and past and all those things. Can you really stop that in negative internal self-talk? Tell us it's very simple. You go to settings, you open up control center, you tap on emotions, and then you turn off self-talk. <laughs> Wouldn't that I, be great? <laughs> I wish it was that easy. I, I believe firmly that you do not turn off your self-talk. Right? You can manage it. Um, Jill Balti taylor she, she was a neuroanatomist, still is a neuro, neuroanatomist. She had a stroke, and her, her book is called My Stroke of Insight. And her left part of her brain just left her. And she said, my self-talk totally stopped. Uh, she had none of the chatter going on. Uh, she calls her self-talk my itty-bitty shitty committee, which is a pretty good name for it. Uh, but in her case, she had a physical thing happen to her brain, and that's what shut down her self-talk. It's one of the few examples we have of a real-life person who documents uh, what happens when you lose your self-talk. Um, so you can't, you can't shut it off unless something like that happens, I believe, but you can manage it. I'm teaching my uh, self-talk to be an internal coach uh, instead of an internal critic. And, I, and yeah. that's been the process. Well, you know, but I, I really wanna get to the basics because your book does walk you through and it's really worth reading. I mean, you come up with wonderful devices. Let's talk about one of your devices, ants. Now, ants are really not a pleasant thing to think about. Uh, why, yeah. do you, why do you use ants as a metaphor for dealing with negative self-talk? Well, that concept came from Daniel Amen, excuse me, who, um, writes a lot about the brain and Jack Canfield uh, quoted him at one point. And I, so I did some research on how Daniel was putting those things together. And I thought, well, that's excellent for what I'm trying to do. I went the extra mile and talked about for each one of his ants, uh, I think about eight, uh, how to exterminate each one of those ants. I'll give you an example. One of his, one of his ants is the always uh, thinking, thinking in absolutes and uh, nothing's going to change. So if someone says, uh, for example, one of the nurse managers said to me, I never get invited to go to the conferences. Uh, and, and that was her uh, internal self-talk, uh, talking to me. And so to exterminate that, you have to ask questions like you would a coach you mean you never get to go to a conference? No one's ever asked you to go to a conference? 
um, how do you know you won't ever get asked to go to a conference? And you sort of explore uh, what that ant is doing uh, to this person's uh, limiting beliefs. But the metaphor has to do with, with the fact that, you know, that they're kind of hard to control and they get into your yeah. system and, yeah. right. and they're there all, all the time. I thought that was an interesting thing that you were talking about and you're going the extra mile on how to use this device was re is really helpful. So yeah. I, let me give you one. Um, I, I have a client because I also coach people and um, I have a client who just believes he's too old and you know nothing's going to ever get better and nothing's ever going to change and no one's going to buy his stuff and his his works <laughs> how, how would you and this is a really intellectually gifted person we're not oh, talking sure. about someone uh who is not sharp or you know we're talking about someone with a really sparkling mind but when it comes to certain things i hear this repeated constant it's you know i'm so old um, whatever so how do you deal with that how do you tackle that? That's a good question. Uh, in, in my work with clients who are similar, I ask them, where did, where do they hear that message? Because it's got to be coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. or who, who is telling them? Is it self-talk? Is it a, a, a parent, a spouse, a friend? Um, what, what is the beginning part of that uh, limiting belief that this mm -hmm. person is putting out there? And then, uh, how, first of all, I think for this person, your example, what tells them that they aren't going to be accepted or promoted or buy whatever they're selling? In other words, you go with the factual stuff first. What What is going on in your life that would tell you that no one's going to like you, buy your stuff or promote you or whatever uh, this person seems to want to put out? I think you just have to explore reality with the person because that's where you know your brain is lying to you. It's sending messages all the time. Uh, and the majority of the messages are default brain function, which is negative. Uh, and then we're, we constantly reprogram that because the, the quality of our thinking is the quality of our life. And I believe the quality of our thinking comes from the quality of our self talk. Just that's sort of, worth saying. That's worth saying again. Say it one more time, the quality of our thinking. The quality of our thinking is the quality of our life. And I believe the quality of our thinking comes from the quality of our self-talk. Uh, this is a big deal because we also have media to deal with. I mean, uh, I see media images coming at me all the time that are reinforcing some of the negative stereotypes and some of them are doing it in reverse now but that's another show we can talk about uh where you know some of the things that we thought were things to avoid like poor eating and obesity are now becoming uh mainstreamed as acceptable of course i have my biases so any viewers who disagree with me uh, but i think it's still important to eat healthy and to live Right. very consciously but anyway isn't the media throwing a lot of negative uh input into people especially about aging uh thinking that you know there's no help for the poor all kinds of problems that you hear every day the world is coming to an end we're right. not going to get to any of the extremist negative stuff but mm -hmm. it's constant yeah so how do you deal I, with it I, well I, I was listening to Joe Dispenza, one of his um, talks the other day, and he uh, believes, and I am now taking that stance as well, uh, I've cut off all the feeds into my email about all the politics and all the news, um, anything that's going on around me, news. I, we don't watch, because I just don't want to, that to permeate my brain and carry it with me. Because it, it sooner or later it produces a fear factor, and that's what a lot of uh, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, at least when I was watching TV on a regular basis, the commercials are based on fear. Uh, 
the politics is based on fear. And these are the things that trigger in my brain what's already there, which is a fear factor that the amygdala picks up on. Am I safe? Uh, am I going to live long? Those kinds of things. And so I, I think we have to sort of now program our brains in a way that we have control over. And that is, what am I going to listen to and allow to um, be repeated in those neuro pathways, which get stronger the more we, we hear things, which is what happens with little kids. I mean, I have a six-year-old granddaughter, and it's been fun to watch her while I was writing this book, incidentally, uh, her self-talk develop. Uh, and it starts, in the research, it starts about three to five years old. When I talk to people and my workshops and my lectures, most people talk about in their teenage years, they pick up that they have a self-talk going on. And that comes from repeated messages over and over again. It doesn't make any difference whether it's coming from the media or from our parents or friends. Our brain sort of attaches onto that and it gets repeated over and over again. And it becomes, as I was talking about, a limiting belief an imposter syndrome or something that we carry with us uh, on into adulthood. So I'm concerned about uh, what, what I'm listening to. Um, I enjoy listening to music a lot more than I ever did before. Uh, I even have a sports, I'm a football fan um, or basketball, whatever the sports going on. I don't even listen to those announcers anymore. I just have list, music playing in the background. We were watching yeah. the game. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I avoid uh, really bad horror movies because I understand uh, the, uh, the impact on the brain. But uh, I do think that, um, you know, your book takes us through how to become a self-coach. Right. So I, it sounds to me like it's a, a discipline of, to some degree. And yes. uh, you even talk in the book about listening. So let me ask you, how does listening, uh, how do you listen to yourself differently now that you have this understanding? Are you more conscious? Are you listening more deeply to yourself? I believe I am. I think my wife would agree with that statement. Um, for me, I, I used to be, uh, when someone was talking, I would think, okay, how do I respond to this? Which is listening, but I'm not sure it's full attention listening. So I uh, breathe a lot deeper uh, during conversations as I've been doing in our conversation. And I allow my, my brain to get some oxygen up to the prefrontal cortex. And I play back uh, what I called in my first book and continue to promote the emotional intelligence um, way of responding to people. And that is asking the three questions. It's a filter I use all the time. And that is, does it need to be said? Does it need to be said by me? And does it need to be said by me now? And that's how my brain is coaching me whenever I'm in a conversation, especially if it's a intense, um, stressful type of conversation that plays back in my brain almost continuously in any conversation. Do I need to respond? Do I need to respond now? You can change that said into anything. Do I need to send this text message. Um, and so that's a very helpful coaching thing that my, my self-talk is doing for me every day. It seems like I, I run that through my brain and keeps me from saying or doing something even more stupid than what I would have done in the first response. Well, you work with, as I said, med medical institutions. It would seem to me that doctors and nurses and support staff would benefit from this kind of learning, this kind of device, this kind of pausing before responding. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, the institution has the pressure of time constraints. Yes. Do you get a chance to give this kind of input inside hospitals? I do. I was at a hospital uh, last week um, giving this lecture on, on my book, which what they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. 
there was only one doctor in the group and the rest were all nurse managers and a few administrators. Um, and there's about uh, 25 or 30 people, which is a pretty good size for the size of this hospital. Um, and there were some good questions. Uh, what people take away and use, uh, I'm not sure what they will do. Uh, doctors uh, tend to be, from my experience, a little bit harder to um, take the time to sit down and want to look at themselves uh, under a microscope a little bit more. In other words, how am I coming across? What am I saying? Um, I, I haven't had conversations with a doctoral group or doctors in a group, um, but I would, I would love to, I would covet to have that opportunity because I think it can be changing professionally and personally in people's lives if they take some of this and use it. Well, there's a, one other place where your book could have tremendous impact. I'm thinking about my own early education experiences and mm. school and things that teachers said that either inspired or knocked you down completely. Right. So um, I'm just thinking your book also, a sequel to your book, you know, is the power of language, speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, what you say to others has a tremendous impact. We started this interview talking about the early programming of children, how they hear that negative information yes. from their parents, some parents. So um, let's say you had a magic wand and we didn't have any political divide and everything was clearer to get some uh, impact in the school system. Yeah. What would you change in the teaching structure? I mean, give, give yourself time to think about this. What would you change? Hmm. Just contextually, uh, one of my uh, beliefs about self-talk is that it's a pro progressive disorder. Hmm. Uh, my six-year-old granddaughter is totally unaware of self-talk. What's interesting is that her teacher, and she's now in first grade, I actually gave her my book and signed it a couple of weeks ago because I was so impressed with what she was doing with my granddaughter's uh, class. What everybody else is doing in school, I, I don't know. Uh, but she is having them uh, take a time out and talk about their feelings. In other words, get it out of your head into the open but even more helpful i i think this teacher is teaching children how to breathe deeply and that we know from all the research in neuroscience that oxygen to the brain when we have an amygdala hijack goes to the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex shuts down and we have all kinds of crazy things that can happen but when we're breathing deeply, we're allowing ourselves to, to think and, and calm down the amygdala. And that's where a lot of issues start anyway. So if I were to do anything in this school system, other than to teach some awareness about self-talk, I think it would be uh, teaching children how to breathe and how to feel safe uh, in their breath. Teach them deep breathing, not just shallow breathing so that they can slow down. Uh, I know uh, Yale uh, Center for Emotional Intelligence has a, a four color grid that talks about the emotions, whether I'm high energy, low energy. Um, this, my granddaughter's teacher is uh, teaching them to metaphorically talk about their emotions. You know, I feel like a rainbow. I feel like a thunderstorm, stuff that they can understand at that level, what, what they're bringing into the classroom every day. Because we know what comes with us is this flood of emotions. I mean, if, if my wife and I have a, a disagreement, which is very rare, and I don't, we don't have a chance to resolve it, I carry that with me all day long. I and mean, I keep reprocessing in my mind. My self-talk is, okay, how, what am I gonna say when I get home? I rehearse it, which is the beauty of self-talk. Coaching myself, what is the best way I can respond uh, to what happened, say, this morning. 
So one of the images we have of self-talk is various sources, but one of my sources comes from Tim Conway's character on the Carol Burnett show. He's an older man. He has a raincoat and scruffy hair, just mumbling as he goes along. Um, and, and that's what we um, have as a vision of self-talk. Uh, Irving Goffman said that we have a taboo against self-talk and the research I did, I found that only 29% of the introductory psychology textbooks uh, for college students even mention self-talk. So I still think we have uh, a taboo and secrecy around self-talk, but like with my clients, once we start sharing our self-talk, we realize the impact self-talk has on how we function in this world. And so that's kind of exciting to see, at least from where I'm going with this book, that people are responding to that. Yeah, I have self-talk too. And now I'm more aware of how to manage it. And I, I didn't ask you a question that I would like to ask, which is about the automatic quality of self-talk. I mean, it's a reactive, it's a, yeah. For many people, it's reactive, and they don't even notice they have self-talk. Yeah. <laughs> I know, and it's, uh, uh, I live with a person, my wife, for 50 years, and it's been fun to watch her progression of self-awareness of her self-talk. I mean, now she's able to say, oh, that was my external self-talk. You don't need to respond. Or um, my self-talk is telling me, that our daughter wants us to do yada, yada, yada. So once you become aware, or once we become aware of our self-talk, we begin to see it, um, you know, all over the place. Uh, I, one of the things I wanted to point out is Jim Gaffigan is my favorite comedian right now. And Jim has the ability to go into a, a third person when he's talking about something that he said so I played this clip of him talking about Jesus, and then he goes into his self-talk, which is a projection of the self-talk of the audience that are listening to him. And he says, oh, he's going to go to hell for that in this higher voice when, he, when he's talking to third person about himself. What's interesting as I watch this clip is that the laughter, they showed the audience, the laughter got louder when he did his self-talk projected onto the to the audience, because many of them probably felt, yeah, he's going to go to hell talking about Jesus that way. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Well, that's great. I I love talking to you. Thank you so much. And uh, this will wrap it up for us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Phyllis.